Welcome to Elite Rugby SNC Podcast, the best podcast talking all things rugby and strength and conditioning. At Elite Rugby SNC, we provide athletes with strength and conditioning programs that provides you with everything you need to become a beast and take your game to the next level. No matter what stage of the year or season, Elite Rugby SNC has a program for you. You can try before you buy, so try our seven day, seven dollar trial to get a taste of what we offer here at Elite Rugby SNC. So take your game to the next level, become a beast, and join Elite Rugby SNC today. Today on the podcast, we have a brand new segment. The segment is called What Can We Learn from Other Sports, Coaches, and Elite Athletes? Often we can get caught up in our own world and forget we can learn from many different other individuals. Every month, we'll try and release an episode and learn from others outside of rugby. The first guest on the podcast, is Olympic and Commonwealth Games elite diving athlete, Annabelle Smith. Bell has competed in three Olympic Games in London, Rio, and Japan. In the Rio Games, Bell secured a bronze medal in the three-meter synchro springboard events. And recently in the 2022 Commonwealth Games, Bell won gold in the three-meter synchro springboard event. On this episode, we talk about the sport of diving, what it takes to become an elite diver. Bell talks about the importance of strength and conditioning training and what her strength and conditioning program looks like for diving. Bell provides an awesome in- insight into how she stays present and focused in the moment when competing at the highest level. And Bell provides great advice for all athletes wanting to be their best. This was a fantastic episode, and I just want to say thanks to Bell for joining me on the podcast. So, good day, Annabelle. How are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you, Kieran? I'm going really well today. Thanks for joining me today. So how's life going at the moment and how's the uh, injury coming along as well? Life is different, but it's still good. Um, I ruptured my Achilles about a month ago now and had surgery just before Christmas to repair that. So that's sort of been the first big injury of my pretty long career. So it's been a bit of a change, but I'm slowly getting from no weight bearing to now I can fully weight bear wearing a boot. So I'm going to be in the boot for a little bit longer, but having a little bit more independence back now has been nice. <laughs> That's awesome. What did it feel like to wrap your Achilles? Because I've seen a couple of like, you know, YouTube videos and stuff of it just popping. Did it feel like someone just, you know, shot you or something like that? Well, a lot of people I've spoken to who have also ruptured their Achilles have said that it feels like someone's kicked you in the back of the leg. But to be honest, I was in the middle of the bush in Africa and just landed on the ground and just felt my foot go numb kind of like pins and needles for about a millisecond and then I just felt like my foot was very floppy and like disconnected from my leg so I had no pain I didn't hear a pop or anything like that it just maybe it was ready to go I'm not sure um but yeah hobbled over to um a car and sat in the car and just knew straight away that that was my Achilles so you did your Achilles on holiday did you I did I did (laughs) Well, I'm, I'm glad they just didn't like leave you there in the, yeah. in, the in the in the jungle of Africa, you know. And yeah, yeah no, they looked good. after me, got me home, and um, yeah, everyone. I've got crutches and a boot that they found in the middle of the Serengeti, so they've made it all the way back home to Australia. Oh, that's nice. But yeah, just it's just bizarre how an Achilles can just go, you know. Like you think you're pretty robust and, and strong down there in that that region, and then it just it just pops. So. That sucks, yeah. but at least you're on the, the men now and um, you sort of got your focus on, on coming back um, stronger stronger than ever. Exactly. I actually met um, Christian Welch the other day and he was telling me all about his Achilles recovery because I think he's about 10 months um, post-surgery now, so I'm going to get some good tips from him. I yeah, think. for sure. Yeah. yeah. The hardest thing would be, um, you know, what type of training are you doing at the moment, you know, to keep fit and active because... You can't really do too much with Achilles, so is it just all upper body focused? Yeah, I've not been doing a lot at all. Um, It's slowly getting a little bit more as I'm becoming more mobile, but yeah, pretty much I can do everything as normal from my hips up. So a lot of upper body can still do quite a bit of core work. Um, And since I've been a bit more mobile, I've started to do a little bit of leg strength just in the machines and mainly on my left leg. Um, I've got to give my right leg a bit of time to recover before I start activating my calf or anything around the Achilles. So I've been doing lots of foot exercises, <laughs> which have been a bit of brain training, I think, when you're so in tune with your body as an athlete, it's really difficult to have an injury like this where you feel like your brain and your foot is disconnected. And um, But it's been interesting. The more you practice it, the easier that it gets, and it's just firing off those um, that nervous system again. 
Yeah, I had um, plantar fasciitis a few years back now. And one of the things was trying to, you know, move my big toe independently and then yeah, all the that's... other digits independently. <laughs> like it is yeah. really hard. Anyone listening right now, like it, it's, it's really hard to do. Like go out there and try it. Like I, I can do it pretty well on my right, left foot. Yeah. I haven't touched and it's quite difficult. Oh, I, the first time my physio told me to do the foot, the toe, big, move my big toe outwards and then also move it down. And I was just staring at my toe being like, move, 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 and nothing was happening. But now I can do it in a second. So it is just yeah. practice. It's a party trick now, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so growing up as a young girl, what sports did you play and how did you end up being a diving athlete? I grew up a really sporty kid, come from a pretty sporty family. Um, and I was doing all the different after school activities. I played soccer, I did netball, I loved little athletics on the weekend. Um, so I was a bit of an all rounder, have an older brother and a younger sister who were always in the backyard kicking the footy, playing backyard cricket. Um, but if I wasn't doing all of that, I was usually bouncing on my trampoline in the backyard and teaching myself backflips and doing all sorts of tricks. Um, so I kind of had a natural aerial awareness, natural acrobatic sort of instincts, even though I didn't do gymnastics. And so when I was about 11, almost 12, uh, my parents took me to a holiday program at our local pool in Victoria. And yeah, I sort of had a go at diving, don't really remember knowing what it was at the time. And the coach saw that I had some potential and begged my parents to put me in a program just once a week on top of everything else. And then pretty quickly after that, Victoria had a junior high performance program start for the first time. And we had a coach come out from China and they're the best in the world in diving. So it was going to be really special that we had that opportunity. I tried out for that program and um, was selected and pretty much from 14 onwards, um, I was training 30 hours a week, had to give up everything else and a huge commitment from my whole family um, that led me to achieving everything that I've achieved over the past 15 years of my career. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. Like, yeah, you don't really hear like talking to people about sports. It's normally the big sports, you know, your yeah. rugby, soccer, AFL and all that. Like, it's really interesting to hear people that adventure out into sports that aren't so popular. So yeah. it was really cool that you went, did a holiday program and found a sport that you like. And do you think participating in all the other sports helped you to make a really good decision in, in choosing diving, but also help you become a better diving athlete as well? Yeah, I definitely developed good coordination, um, you know, lots of strength and power just from being so active and doing all those different types of sports. Um, I think my parents always knew that I'd probably end up in a sport trying to make it to the Olympics because I was that kid who always dreamt of it, always wanted to be the best, very competitive. Um, like, you know, people laugh about the kids who take PE class in primary school seriously, like it's the Olympics, like that was me. I was that kid. <laughs> um, so I just had this natural drive and um, athleticism that once I chose diving and committed to that, then, you know, when you're training 30 hours a week at that age, especially, and there's so much um, improvement to be made at such an early phase in your career, I think it was just a good recipe for success and, and put me in a really good position to do well because I was so committed to it. So yeah, I definitely, you know, when I see kids these days that have just been in one sport from a really young age and don't have all those different skills, which a lot of divers start in gymnastics, come to diving, they don't know how to catch a ball. So for me, I've been pretty, um, I feel good and I feel, um, you know, grateful that I had so many different sports as a kid that gave me lots of different skills. Because if my diving career ended, you know, when I was 18, I probably would have taken up something else or gone back to soccer or um, something like that and, and still try to make it so yeah I'm pretty grateful for my upbringing yeah it's it's something that with myself and Ben and some other uh, guests who have come on like we've talked about it's it's so important to adventure out and go do other sports like you just don't know what skills you're going to bring over to the sport you do choose in the end like for myself playing um, baseball and softball throughout my you know, sort of youth until I was 15 like allowed me to understand how to move my body, body laterally, but also yeah. read the ball path and just learning how to throw as well was a, a skill of learning how to control my body to then throw the ball with my arm and not just use, you know, use your arm the whole time. So 100%. yeah, if you're athletes out there, don't just focus on your one sport all the time, adventure out and, and go do some other sports. If you've heard it here again from uh, an Olympic superstar, so definitely do it. 
So today's theme is what can we learn from yourself and, you know, learning from the sport of diving, because it's not just all about our sport here at rugby union or rugby league. Like there's many things you can learn. So what's it like being a diving athlete competing in the three, uh, the three meter springboard and 10 meter platform synchro events. Can you give us a bit of an insight um, into that? Yeah, it's it's very different. So in diving, we have the three meter springboard, which is a bouncy board that you need a lot of leg strength and a lot of leg power to be able to push the board down and press it and jump really high to be able to fit in all your somersaults. And then we have the 10 meter platform event, which is obviously much higher, but you're diving off a solid platform. So um, you're hitting the water at about 60 kilometers an hour and need a lot more upper body strength and endurance um, to ensure that your body's, um, you know, preventing your body from getting injured. So two very different events. Um, when you're younger, you generally do everything and try and figure out which you're going to be better, better at. Um, and for me, I did both until I was about 21, 22. And then a coach that I was training with at the time at our institute back then in Brisbane, um, he thought that I was going to be better suited to springboard. And pretty much it's very rare to find someone who's going to be the best in the world at both because they are so different. So they require different training styles. Um, so I just stuck to three meter springboard because I'm very naturally powerful and strong through my legs and was struggling with some tricep tears from 10 meter. So came down to three meter and found my feet um, and, you know, had a lot of success internationally on there. Since I've had the call up back to 10 meter a couple of times and the last time I, I did that was probably 2017 I think or start of 2018 um, and since then I've just stayed back down on um, the springboard so my body shape and my body type and where my strengths are is very much suited to springboard um, and I'm much happier being lower down to the ground than mm. <laughs> way up on 10 meter I can't believe the things I used to do up there as a kid so it takes a lot of um, you know, guts and courage to throw yourself backwards off 10 meter and spin three and a half times. So pretty happy. I don't have to do that anymore. Yeah. I think some, some rugby athletes listening to this would be um, pretty frightened to, to go up there on the 10 meter and do those type of tricks, but land in a good position, but not making a big splash. I think that's the thing that I can't wrap my head around is how do you like, how do you stop making that big splash? Cause us rugby guys were uh, quite big. So we tend to make a big splash when we jump into the pool. Yeah, I mean, it's all about body tension. So all the training we do in the gym, all the training we do um, in our dry land sessions, so like on the trampolines and the diving boards that land on crash mats and a lot of diving specific exercises we do in our warm up. Everything is for that body tension, body alignment to try and make yourself, um, you know, as tight going through the water as you can to get that rip entry, which is what we call you can hear that rip sort of sound um, and hopefully make no splash. So it is challenging, but when you train for 15, 16, 17 years, you hope by then that you've got it down pat. When you, when you first started, was there quite a few belly flops and stuff, you know, just, and then you slowly got better over time or? Oh, hundred percent. So many wipeouts. I remember growing up with that group that I had in that junior high performance program. And every time someone learned something new on 10 meter, we'd all be ready on the side of the pool to like jump in and go save them if they wiped out. So that happened quite a lot. Um, we have these jets on the bottom of the pool that uh, produce bubbles when you use when you're learning a new dive, so it softens the surface a little bit. And I it remember, still hurt, wouldn't it? Like, oh, like, it still hurts. Yeah. I remember landing <laughs> face like face first, eyes open into these huge bubbles, and I think I was crying chlorine for about a week after that. So, yeah, definitely some tough times. Yeah, yeah. I guess you're just you're just learning the hard way, you know. So exactly. Yeah. So what are the physical attributes needed to be successful in the sport you, you talked about power but can you sort of elaborate that a bit more and what, what are some other attributes needed sure so yeah for me in my three meter springboard event definitely leg strength and leg power um, as i said to be able to press the board down and get as much power out of the springboard as you can um, for all divers we need really good core strength and core stability because we're somersaulting we're you know getting our bodies in a tuck position a pike position we're twisting um, and so many of those little muscles, deep muscles in your core uh, have to be really strong and activated to ensure that we can stay in those tight positions and also prevent us from getting injured. Um, a lot of divers struggle with back problems and, um, you know, getting that core really strong can often prevent those things from happening. 
Um, it's really a full body sort of thing because we're obviously landing in a position where we're going head first into the water. So you have to have really strong arms, strong shoulders. Um, and I guess as I've gotten older, the sort of prehab exercises and activating those little muscles in my shoulders, my rotator cuffs, my glutes, um, my ankles, everything needs to be firing to make sure that um, your body can tolerate the load that we're putting through our bodies every day. And diving's n- not really a sport where you're doing things that are sort of natural. So, um, you know, our bodies are being stretched and pulled and um, put into different positions. So it's really important that we have that whole body strength, um, yeah, to prevent injury and, and also get the best out of our diving. Yeah, it's great because you don't just want to focus on one area more than than the other. And like you said, it's a whole body um, sport movement. And I think in, in rugby, we can sort of get a bit too much focus on, you know, focusing on the upper body a bit too much. You know, you're staring yourself in the gym and forgetting to, to train the lower body, but and then forgetting to train your core. Like for some people, core training is just a few sit-ups, a few ankle touches and the dreaded Russian twist, but there's so much more to it. And you just got to make sure that you're continually doing that throughout your training. But also, like you said, before actually going to you know training at the pool you're doing your prehab exercises and i can't stress that enough for rugby athletes going to training you know don't just rock up out of the car and just go straight into it do some little preparation work to prepare yourself for the for the training ahead yeah that stuff's the boring stuff but it's usually the people who are doing that are the ones that are separating themselves from the rest of the group so um i also highly recommend (laughs) that's awesome so you got to have a strong body but you also got to have a strong mind how do you mentally prepare yourself for each dive? Like what's, what's that routine um, to get, to get into the zone? For me, I I do quite a bit of visualization. So, um, you know, in training, we're doing so many repetitions. So it's, it's quite hard to be pausing and doing a full routine before every dive, because as you know, we're getting through 60, 80 dives in a session. So you do have to sort of keep moving, but to have that focus um, and purpose behind every rep that you do to make it count, Sometimes you just go through the motions and you get to the end of the session and you think, mm, did I really gain anything from that? Um, but the sessions where I do have more, um, you know, purpose and focus behind what my coach is saying and trying to translate that into my actions, that they're the best sessions. Um, some days also, you know, I rock up to training and I don't feel great, don't want to be there, I've had a busy day, I might be feeling tired. And I think they're the sessions where you build that resilience to know you can get through those sessions because, you might rock up to the Olympic Games and the morning of your competition, you feel like trash and it's the Olympics. So you still want to know that your body can perform under those conditions. So that's what we practice in training. Um, we don't just come on a day that we feel off and say, all right, I'm going to go home because we've got to practice for all conditions um, and put us in the best position to dive well under any circumstance. So it takes a lot of mental toughness, a lot of resilience, but that that is what makes you a great athlete. And I feel like having so many challenges across my career, I can now stand on a diving board and bring my focus into that one moment and know I can execute a great dive because I've practiced it so much. So, yeah, you can get to the Olympics and line up and have 12 incredible physical, physically the same divers, but the person who's going to win is the person who's strongest in their mind. So, um, yeah, that's always at the forefront of my focus at training and, and trying to prepare the best I can for that. Mm, no, that's awesome. So when you are using visual, visualization, are you focusing on just getting through the process and not really worrying about the outcome of that dive? You're just like, okay, what's my routine to get to here? I take a couple of breaths, you know, and then dive. Like, yeah, can you sort of delve into that a bit more? Yeah. So say I'm in a competition and I'm preparing for one of my dives. I definitely am focusing on the process more than the outcome. Um, Take what my coach, you know, he'll give me a couple of cue words to focus on, whether that's, you know, hold your arms up on the end of the board or, um, you know, feel tight, feel feel that squeeze um, of your tuck position in the air, whatever that cue is, I'm focusing on seeing that in my mind, seeing myself doing exactly what he said um, and then visualizing the perfect dive. So if I'm thinking of myself falling off the side of the board and doing something bad, then nine times out of 10, that'll probably happen. So I'm trying to visualize the perfect dive that I can do. And I see myself as myself doing it. And then I see myself as from the side view and and watching myself doing it. And those two things combined, um, along with those keywords that I'm thinking of, that breathing techniques to calm my heart rate before I go, 
once I start walking down the board, I'm committed and I'm just trying to be positive and achieve, you know, that perfect dive that I can do. Yeah, it's awesome. I've seen um, a couple other athletes and one of them was, it was a video during um, university, our uh, lecturer showed us this video of a ho ice hockey athlete and he was just sitting on the, the side, um, the sideline and he just had his stick in his hand. No one was on the ice and he was just going through the motions with, and he was moving the stick at the same time, but he was talking to himself. He's like, this is how I do this, that and that. Um, is that something you would do yourself, like to stand to the side of the of the pool and just, you know, just look look up there and just sort of talk to yourself a bit as well? Yeah, especially when we get to a new pool or in a new environment, you want to sort of take it all in and, and try and adapt to your new environment as quickly as you can. So usually when we first arrive, I'll do that and I'll scope out everything and just see myself diving on those specific diving boards. Um, but also during training sessions at home, sometimes if I get overwhelmed or I'm getting frustrated or I can't make a change that I'm trying to change, I'll just step away from the diving boards and I'll give myself, you know, a couple of minutes to, to regather and to um, get back into a better headspace before starting again. So those techniques of mindfulness and bringing yourself back to the present moment are really important in an elite athlete's um, performance. So I definitely practice that as much as I can. Yeah, it's awesome. I think you've already sort of answered this next question, but feel free to add some more into it. Like when a dive doesn't go go your way, how do you bounce back and refocus to be able to get back to what you what you know you can do and have a good dive? Yeah, well, I think like with anything, as soon as something has happened, it's the same with my leg. As soon as I ruptured my Achilles, well, I can't take that back now. It's happened. i got to get on with it. Um, I can choose to mope around and be negative and be, you know, feel sorry for myself, but that's not really going to help me. Um, move forward so I've just got to make that choice to keep going and power on through same in a competition if I do a bad dive I can sit there and be angry and think about it um, you know be mad at myself but if I've still got four more dives to come in the competition it's not going to help me be in a good mindset to do those well so you either throw in the towel and do the rest of them badly or you forget about that that's happened move on to the next and focus on what you can control in that moment so yeah always about moving on focus on what's right, right ahead of you um, and, yeah, pick yourself back up because in a competition it's not over till it's over. In a rugby game it's not over till that final whistle or the siren goes. So um, anything can happen and I've seen people win before and still make big mistakes in their list. So um, you just got to keep going. I imagine it will be quite hard doing it in a synchro event with a, with a teammate. So imagine you have a good dive and they have a shit dive. Yeah. How do you be a good teammate and sort of pick them back up to, you know, get back to and focus on the objective at hand? Yeah, well, as much as diving is an individual sport, if you're in a synchro team, you are in a team. So I always just put myself in the position of that could have been me. I've made mistakes before. Maddie, who's my synchro partner, sometimes she's made a mistake and we both just support each other to know we're trying to do the best that we can. And sometimes mistakes happen. That's just sport. That's just life. So um, yeah, we pick each other both up and just keep going. So we know the mission that we're on and that's all we try and focus on. Yeah, that's awesome. It's it, it, it's definitely a thing. It's really hard to do, you know, take ownership of your, your mistakes, but it's very easy to, you know, criticize someone else for not doing their role within the team. But if you can just sort of, like you said, put yourself in their shoes and, and understand that people make mistakes, that they get, they're going to bounce back from it. But if you were to, you know, swear at them or call them out like that, it's probably not going to help the situation, you know. So you really got to make sure that you're being the best teammate that you can be, help them bounce back, and then remember we are in a team sport environment. So you got to, you got to, you got to help each other. Yeah, and the the person who has made the mistake, I don't think they're going to bounce back so quickly if you tear them down. So um, I think building them up is going to put them back in the right mindset straight away. Yeah, hundred percent. So reflecting on a past performance in the 2022 Com Games, you won the, the gold on the three-metre synchro event. Can you talk about this experience? Like what went right in this competition and how did you make the most of the Com Games um, as well? Well, there's a long story to it, but I'll cut it short. Um, if we go back four years to the 2018 Commonwealth Games on the Gold Coast, home Commonwealth Games, very special to be able to experience that in front of a home crowd. All my friends and family were there. Maddie and I have been doing synchro for a long time and we won a bronze medal at the Olympics in 2016. So everyone sort of thought 2018, you guys are going to win gold. Um, we were in a really good position to do that. We were also trying to do a dive at the time that no other female 
diving pair were doing. It's a forward two and a half somersaults with two twists. Usually the females just do one twist. And so we've done this dive in this competition. We were coming first after four dives. We had that big dive to come and we fully mucked it up, um, failed the dive, legs went this way, legs went that way, and we ended up coming last. So that was a bit of an embarrassing um, event for us and, and pretty disappointing to have not followed through on our potential. But again, we were trying to do this big dive that we were trying to push the boundaries in our sport. So if we fast forward four years to Birmingham, um, last year and again we've had a couple of challenges over the last few years we weren't able to get to the Tokyo Olympics for that event because we couldn't qualify because of COVID and all the rest of it and so this was really our redemption last year to try and get back on the scene and, and prove to everyone that we still had it so we've just had so many years of training under our belt um, we had the confidence that we knew if we dived well we didn't even have to dive our best if we dove well, then we were going to, we were going to win that gold medal. So we also tried to take our focus off winning that gold medal and just do our dives, how we know we can do them. Our training had been pretty good, solid. So that's all we needed to do. And yeah, I'm just very relieved. I was very relieved and very proud that um, we had a very good competition. We dived really well. There was a huge crowd there. So to hold up under that pressure, um, I think it was just a moment where we, all our coaches and Maddie and I as a team, just felt so much relief and so much um, pride to have have done the job and got it done. So when you reflect back on the 2018, do you think you were focusing too much on on the expectations of you winning? Like we're, we're favorites to win, we're, we're meant to win the gold medal um, and not actually focusing on the process? Yeah, I think so. I definitely felt a huge weight on my shoulders at that 2018 event. Um, but on add on top of that, doing that really hard dive just made me so nervous and Looking back, we probably should have just stuck to, um, you know, the easier dive because we knew we would have done that well. But as I said, this was all part of the plan and part of the process leading into the 2020 Olympics and trying to get this dive going before, you know, had two years to perfect it and get it better for the Olympics. Um, obviously, then we didn't know what was coming up and what was going to happen a couple of years later. But, you know, we had a crack and people um, remember that and remember us for having a crack. So, it's obviously um, not great to do that on the world stage and make that mistake, but we know what we're trying to do and that's all that matters. Yeah, you're pushing the boundaries of the sport. You know, you're going, you're going hard. Like, why not sort of celebrate it? If you uh, stuff it up, who cares? You know, at least you're trying something different and trying to, you know, evolve the sport and really step the standard up. Have you guys been able to nail that dive yet? Or uh, That dive has taken a back seat. We've just sort okay. of parked that. <laughs> we <We've- laughs> Stuck to what we uh, feel comfortable with. So, um, yeah, I'm pretty happy that we're just doing the one twist again and we can perfect that. Okay, easy done. So we've talked a lot about, you know, sport and all that, but when you're not in sport, you know, it's, it's, it's important to get away, to not focus on diving or just doesn't matter what sport it is. What do you like to do in your spare time? you got certain TV shows, you know, you like to read books, you like to go I don't know, explore the city that you're in. What do you like to do? I'm a really big outdoors adventure fun kind of girl so I do love traveling I love seeing new places any time off that we get I'm usually overseas somewhere trying to explore a new country a new city um, I get so much energy from meeting new people and being in different cultures and um, yeah that's sort of what like sets me on fire is just getting out and about and experiencing new things um, when I'm at home, I don't usually have a lot of time to watch TV, but at the moment I have been going through Netflix and all the streaming services because I've had so much more time, um, especially over Christmas and New Year's when I pretty much was just living on the couch with my leg up. Um, my friend also bought me six books and I've never been a reader and she said, you're going to become a reader because you also now have time to sit and focus on reading. Um, but my attention span is also pretty short. So <laughs> I uh, I have to really focus if I'm going to sit down and read a book. Um, but I have been enjoying that. I've been reading just, you know, some easy peasy, quick and easy reads. Um, but when I think about what I really love outside of the pool, it is, um, you know, I love being a mentor to the younger athletes. I love giving back to the communities and so much that I've learned as an athlete, I feel like um you know people can relate to even if they're not athletes themselves some of the hardships that resilience the leadership all those things people can um take lessons from so yeah love traveling love the public speaking and going around to schools and chatting to 
new people um, and also I'm just a big family and friends girl so love having my um, close support network around me and just hanging out watching movies on the weekend. That's awesome. Um, it sounds like you got some good ways to sort of forget about the sport for a little bit, you know, because if you get too too focused too much, you can probably have a, a negative impact on performance and you're just getting too overwhelmed and not being able to, you know, separate yourself. So it's good that you got some um, good outlets there to, um, you know, just remember that you're, you're more than an athlete. You got stuff outside of, uh, of the sport. So that, that's really great to hear and see. Yeah, I'm very passionate about that balance because I've had periods in my career where I've put all my eggs into diving um, and all my focus into my training and I probably have was performing the worst that I ever had at those times. So now that I've got a lot more balance outside the pool, um, I have Wednesdays off every week and I call it my Wellness Wednesday and it's dedicated to me doing things that I enjoy and make me feel good. So, um, you know, that has enabled me when I am at training, I can focus on training and put all my energy into that and then as soon as I leave the pool, uh, I'm just a normal person doing normal things wellness wednesday i think you should uh start a movement on that i know i'm wellness. trying <laughs> yeah wellness wonder treat yourself on that day as well it sounds exactly. like exactly yeah that's awesome hi everyone we just want to take a quick break from this episode we hope you're enjoying this episode so far and all the content we have produced we appreciate all the support from our listeners and followers so far if you haven't already sign up to elite rugby snc blog today we provide free exclusive content every single week to our subscribers. You'll find our website link in our bio below. Remember to like, subscribe and share Elite Rugby SNC on all social media platforms to all your family and friends. Thanks again for all your support and now back to the episode. So strength conditioning, how has strength conditioning training helped you become a better athlete for diving? Well, without strength and conditioning and the proper expertise, the proper coaches behind that, um, I definitely would have been a lot more injured ac across my career and not got the best out of my own body. Um, it's really interesting every time we have a bit of time off, whether that's two weeks um, or even, you know, four days, I can feel the difference when I'm consistently training and consistently putting in the work for those, um, you know, the training program, my exercise prescription that's specific to me and my needs and my abilities. Um, I feel like the best version of myself when that is consistent and I feel like I'm getting stronger. I feel in control. I feel like I'm not going to injure myself. Um, that's the best place to be compared to when you aren't doing the right thing or it's inconsistent or you've had time off and you can feel like you've, you know, you lost all the strength and whatever, but it's always a process following that program to get back to where you know you can be. And I'm always surprised in a few weeks, I sort of feel back at it and feel good again. Um, but it does make you realize that it is a process and this is all, you know, there is science behind it. And um, I'm pretty lucky to have a really good team around me who um, puts me in the best position to be the strongest version of myself. That's awesome. When did the um, SNC program start for you? Like you've, you've done Ooh. that holiday program and then you got identified to be in the diving program. Yeah. What, when did um, the strength conditioning come along? I think I got an individual scholarship um, as a development kid at the Victorian Institute of Sport, I think when I was about 15 and had access, that was my first time having access to a proper gym and um, having a strength and conditioning coach write my own program. Prior to that, it was more just, you know, we'd, we'd just do diving specific um, exercises and running around sort of circuits at the pool. Um, but yeah, since I was 15, I've had exercise programs um, from a coach and yeah, they're much more specific to the needs of our sport and, you can see the difference between athletes that have access to that and go on to the elite pathway compared to just, you know, kids who are doing diving for fun. And it's a completely different, um, you know, completely different ends of the spectrum in terms of um, where you can take the sport. So it's very important. It's been very important in my career. That's awesome. So what does an SNC program look like for diving? What's the, the focus in the gym? What's your training split um, and anything else you can provide us? So we do uh, three gym sessions a week, Tuesday morning, Thursday morning, and Saturday morning. And my exercises are the main part of my program are different on those three days. They're all still a main priority for me is the leg strength and power. So, um, you know, one day I might have back squats. On the Thursday, I might have step ups. Um, on the Saturday, I might have leg press. Like it, the exercises change, but the focus is the same on that leg strength and power. Um, the start of all my programs is always a warm up. all my prehab exercises, activating all the parts of my body. And then I go into that main set 
um, predominantly legs and also one or two arm exercises in there as well to um, make sure my shoulders, um, you know, stay stabilized and all the muscles around them are strong. And then I always have core at the end of my program. We do um, ab exercises, but also back exercises, um, side holds, and we're kind of targeting the th whole 360 of your core. Um, and then sometimes at the end, I do a little bit of cardio. Not often. Diving is not a cardio-based sport. We don't have to, you know, I perform for two seconds every dive. So um, not very cardio fit, but at the moment, with my leg being in a boot, I've been... Um, you know, you, you, you never want to be that person as an athlete. You, when you walk in the gym and see someone on the arm crank, you just know that they're injured because that, they're doing, they're, they're rolling their arms around and they're in a boot with their leg up. And that's been me for a couple of weeks, but I've I've uh, progressed onto the bike that has the handles going. Yeah, like, the assault so, bike. Yeah, the assault bike. And let me tell you, it's not fun, but it's better than the arm crank. So I'm getting my sweat on at the moment, which is which has been good, something different. Have you tried doing the rower with your other foot on like a, oh, it's, a it's just like a board with these like tr like little, oh, little, little trolley wheels? Yeah, I have seen people do that. I've not yeah. progressed to that. But that might be coming next. So yeah, something different. Not, At least getting your lower one lower body exactly. um, leg and your upper body together. So I'm not sure I have very good rowing technique, but maybe I can try that. Yeah, try it out. It's definitely worked. I've used it before and used it with some other athletes. It's yeah. it's a pretty good uh good thing to have. Good to know. So what advice do you have for, you know, younger athletes, um, you know, coming through their career and, and wanting to partake in a strength conditioning program They might be doing it themselves and they might be a bit afraid sort of coming into the gym. Do, do you have any advice for, for those athletes? Um, I definitely would encourage you to get or to make sure that you have got some professional help behind what you're doing. Um, you know, a lot of gyms have, uh, people who have either a strength and conditioning background or an exercise science background and are there to help you do the right thing. So, um, or a coach might also be able to lead you in the right direction. Also just to not compare yourself. If you walk into a gym and see someone else doing an, an exercise and you think, oh, maybe I need to do that. Everyone has different needs. Everyone's bodies are different. Um, my program is completely different to one of my teammates programs because we are two different athletes. Um, so don't compare yourself and just stay on your path and know what you need to do. Um, but also just have some courage to step into an uncomfortable place or an uncomfortable zone and know that you're going to come out better for it anyway. So yeah, don't be afraid. Yeah. Don't, don't feel too, too intimidated. It is quite scary going to a new environment yeah. um, or a new gym or it's your first time, but just remember everyone's there to try and improve themselves. Yeah, you, they might look at you every now and again because you're doing something weird that you probably shouldn't be doing, but <laughs> you'll 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 slowly learn. And, and some good gyms have some good members who will come up and say, "Hey, you probably shouldn't be doing that." But just remember, everyone's there to try and improve themselves and focus on them. Um, and just remember, you're there to do do the same thing as well. And you have to start somewhere, so you just yeah. got to get your foot in the door, and then it's only going to get better. Yeah, hundred percent. So moving on to the Olympics. What have been the highlights of your experience competing at the Olympics across all three appearances that you've been in? Oh, the highlights. Definitely my first Olympics in London, 2012. Um, as I said, I was that kid who just wanted to go to the Olympics and, and idolised sporting stars. And just to, to be in that environment with some of my idols, um, seeing people walk around that I had only really seen on TV before and just thought they were the bee's knees. Um, yeah, I was just in awe the whole time. And getting to go and watch other sports and cheer on the Australians from other, um, you know, in other disciplines. I've usually just been in diving environments where we go to competitions and we're with the same people. So to be able to watch the basketball and the volleyball and the water polo and all these cool sports um, was so much fun. I got photos with Usain Bolt, David Beckham. Um, yeah, it was just crazy to see all these like amazing sporting people. Um, then fast forward to Rio, obviously winning a bronze medal was just incredible. It was a completely different experience to London. It was an outdoor pool that we competed in. It did turn green, but thankfully I, I was finished competing by the time it turned green. Um, we got to do a helicopter tour over Rio. I got to go to the top of Christ the Redeemer with my medal. That was crazy. Um, and then if we go to Tokyo, completely different experience again because of COVID and we weren't allowed to do a lot. Everyone was wearing masks. There was lots of rules. Um, but I think just having that appreciation, everyone had that appreciation that we were there and that happened and that we got to compete. And, um, you know, it was pretty special after everything that we'd all been through. So 
different different every time, but so many highlights. And you really, once you've been to the Olympics, you just know that feeling and why people strive for so many years to get there is because it is so special and it's a competition and an environment that's really hard to describe if you haven't been there. Yeah. How did you find the cardboard beds? Um, were, they, were they comfortable? <laughs> they were actually or? comfortable. I didn't mind it. I'm a pretty small human, so um, I'm not sure how I would have felt if I was a basketballer and seven feet tall, but I was pretty comfortable in my cardboard bed. <laughs> mm, fair enough. Yeah, it's, it, it's interesting because you're going to the event and – you're an elite athlete yourself, but you see other elite ap- athletes, like you said, Usain Bolt, David Beckham. And then um, I think it wasn't the last one. It was the previous before that, the Olympics, the USA dream team was on, on a boat. Yeah. I think it was like, it must just be incredible just to be able to see these people just. Yeah. Yeah. It is crazy, but it also makes you realize, you know, I'm here training my butt off every year, every day, every hour to try and be the best in the world. And and I'm in this same competition that you've also been training for most of your life and you're here too. So it makes you sort of realise and feel proud of yourself for getting there. Obviously, there's bigger sports that have, um, you know, more coverage and they've got bigger names, but you really do feel good when you're side by side with those athletes and, you know, realise all the effort that you've put in as well is is matching there. So, yeah, it's pretty crazy. Maybe David Beckham wanted a photo of you. Did you ever say exactly. that? Exactly. No. Exactly. He's not the one that chased me down the, the exit stairs. I was the one chasing him, but it's fine. He was very happy to take a photo with me. Yeah, that's awesome. Hopefully this this next Olympic Games you can get sort of back to normal and allow to, you know, adventure out into the Olympic Village, not having to wear masks all the time and also enjoy yourself after you compete and not just get sent home straight away, which which de- would definitely suck. Yeah, that's, you know, some some of my motivation to keep going. I probably could have retired now after 2020, after 2022. Um, but one of my big motivations is just to have that experience again and it be normal and it be, you know, just like I know it was in 2012 and 2016. And, um, you know, I've never really been that athlete that feels like I need to go out on a high or whatever. I've achieved everything I could possibly have, you know, dreamt of in my career already. So, um, just to have one more experience and and see what that would be like. That's part of my motivation for continuing. Mm, that's really interesting. And maybe you have one of the best performances because you you know you've already achieved a lot and you can just go out there and do it for you. So it would be, be really yeah. interesting to see that. Yeah. My Achilles has thrown a little bit of a spanner in the works, but mm. I've, got, I've got the best team around me, so I'm pretty confident that I'll be able to get back in and, and it will all just be another chapter in the book one day maybe. <laughs> yeah. Just definitely keep an eye out for that book as well. Yeah. So what strategies do you, um, you know, ha- have in place to not be so overwhelmed while competing at the Olympics? Like I imagine your first one, like you said, you just went and were like, wow, like what is this? I made the Olympics, but there's all these superstars around. Yeah. Do you have any specific tactics sort of in place to manage yeah, your emotions and stay focused on the task at hand? Yeah, I think we do a lot of work with our sports psychologists who prepare us for those big Um, moments in our careers and that's what we train for those big moments so I used to get really scared of going into competitions and be worried about what if I make a mistake or what if I you know what are people going to think of me and and my focus was really external and she helped me to bring that back in and think well why am I doing this sport why am I training every day if I'm going to get to a competition and not want to be there Um, so when I reframed all that and really just focused on myself and trying to get the best out of myself and getting to a competition knowing I felt prepared because I'd done all the work and and then just letting that hard work, um, you know, show for itself. And when you think about it, the environment's different, the pressure's different, there's more cameras, but you're still doing the same dives that you practice every single day. So you just have to bring yourself back to that, bring your focus back to that process and not get carried away with what's happening around you. So it definitely takes practice and it comes more natural to some people than others. Um, but I had to put a lot of work into that area and um, really focusing on bringing it back to basics and not getting uh, too distracted by what's going on around me. It's it's definitely a skill to be able to not focus on what happens if I do a bad dive, what happens if this happens, or I get a bit rushed and I'm not in the, the, the mindset and routine that I wanted to be. Like, it's definitely hard. Like, I've been watching the, the tests on Amazon, if anyone's been watching that, and it's been really interesting to see. It was Aaron Finch, like... He was focused on not getting out. So what happened? He was getting out all the time. But when he went back to getting the process down packed, 
he started getting runs again. So it's just interesting to hear from yourself looking at other sports and then even myself, you know, just reflecting on past performances and all that. It's like, yeah, maybe I was focusing too much on the negative and those and not being able to control, not focusing on the things I can control and, you know, backing myself like, no, wait, I've actually done so much work right now. I, I'm in the best position I can be. Who, who cares if I get out? I'm just going to go out there and do the best that I can. Yeah, it's a pretty pretty simple switch that you can flick in your head to focus on um, positives versus negatives, and but you just have to be aware of it. So it is very easy to go down the path of worry, doubt, fear, all that, because they're more powerful emotions, I think, than the good ones. But once you make the choice to, you know, if those thoughts come in, you just let them go back out and not, and not give them power. So um, it can definitely make a huge difference in performance. Mm. And it's, for me, it comes down to, again, like, what kind of story are you telling yourself? Are you, are, you, are you telling that, you know, neutral, positive story or is your story quite negative? Like, are you actually paying attention to the words that are in here in your mind or the words that you say out loud? Like, make, make sure they are a bit more positive and a bit more neutral. Like, it doesn't have to be negative, but just um, that neutral mindset as well is, is another topic in itself. But, yeah, neutral, yeah. positive mindset. And what's your, what's your story that you're telling yourself? Because if you're telling yourself a negative story, it's probably going to come true and happen. Exactly. Hmm. So moving on to one of my favorite segments, the Triple H. So talking about a hardship, hero and a highlight. Hardship. Can you think of a hardship in your diving career that sort of stands out? It could be the Achilles one right now, but how, how did you get through this hardship and what did you learn along the way as well? Yeah, one that sticks out for me was back in 2015. Um, we were leading into our world championship trials, which were the first sort of qualifying event for the 2016 Olympic Games and leading into that trials I sustained a rib injury I strained my um, sprained my ribs and you know couldn't move couldn't get into the positions that I needed to get into so unfortunately had to withdraw from that competition I put in an appeal to be selected on injury clause and I was still going to have time before that you know before the actual world championships to get back um, to full health and unfortunately was not selected missed out on that event um, and really felt like I'd just been pushed aside. I'd been on the national team for several years. I'd always been on the, at those major events. And because I wasn't selected, I just felt like, oh, maybe they don't think I'm good enough anymore and I'm not going to be able to get back um, onto that team. And, you know, n most of the time, the people who were competing at that World Champs the year before are most likely going to go on to compete at the Olympic Games. So took a bit of a hit to my confidence. And um, I was also living in Brisbane at that time. And I moved back home after that injury and, got a really good team around me in Melbourne back at my um, Victorian Institute of Sport where I'd been since I was a kid and they helped me not only recover from my injury but also get back to believing in myself and really um, you know figuring out who I was and why I wanted to be there and and getting myself back to the best I could be on the boards and fast forward to the 2016 Olympics and I obviously was back on the team and we won an Olympic medal so having that shift from worrying about judgment and, you know, taking on, um, you know, and most of it I was probably making up in my head, but I was pretty sensitive. And when you're at a low point, you can kind of you take those hits heavier, I think. Um, but to flip my mindset and to get that team around me who made me believe in myself again, that was really an integral part of my career. And I think when I really switched from, um, you know, focusing on things that were out of my control compared to, focusing on what I can control and, and just trying to be the best version of me, whether it was good or bad or I won or I came last, as long as I was doing the things that made me feel good, then I was going to be happy at the end of the day. No, it's awesome. Like you're setting a setback to a comeback and something that I heard the other day and I've heard, I've heard it multiple times, but I don't know, it just resonated with me again the other day is hitting rock bottom. It's a great way to um, build a foundation. You know, it's nice and nice and sturdy down there on the rock bed. So why not build a nice foundation and build yourself back up? So, and, and it's a great story that you just said. So, and it turned out quite well, you know, not getting selected for that team. You were able to reflect and be like, hey, do I want to continue in the sport? What's my why? Go back to where I'm pretty comfortable and got a good network and then build myself back up. And it, it definitely paid off. So that's awesome to see. Thank you. So hero, who was your hero or heroes? And why is this person your hero? So growing up, um, it's probably similar for a lot of people my age, but my first memory of the Olympic Games was the 2000 Olympics in Sydney and watching Kathy Freeman win her gold medal. Um, that was the moment that I think I said to my parents, I want 
I want to compete for Australia. I want to go to the Olympics. And I was obviously doing athletics at the time as well. So I think like any supportive parents, they patted me on the back and said, oh, yeah, maybe one day, like not thinking that it would probably come true. So I've always looked up to Kathy Freeman and her story is pretty special. And um, I've been very fortunate to meet her several times in my throughout my career now. And she was actually over in Rio with the Australian team and got to show her my bronze medal. So it's sort of a full circle moment um, to share that with her as well. So, uh, yeah, I've got lots of sporting idols, but from the start, definitely Kathy Freeman. That's awesome. She definitely changed the game, you know, and just that, that, that performance was just iconic and incredible itself. And yeah, no, it's awesome. And it was great. You also got to meet her that, that full circle moment, um, yeah. to meet your hero and, and, you know, share some stories and share your medal. Like, yeah, no, it's fantastic. And last one, highlight. What is the main highlight that sort of stands out in your diving career so far? Ooh, highlight. I've definitely had a few, but um, if I go back to 2018, Commonwealth Games on the Gold Coast, I said how Maddie and I made a mistake in synchro. We went from first to last and whatever, sort of blew that all up. But um, the next day I had to come back and I competed in three-meter individual and I hadn't won an individual medal at a major um, Commonwealth Games or Olympic Games before and after a pretty difficult day the day before still had my family and friends watching me in the stands for my individual event and probably had one of the best comps of my life and ended up coming third in that event so that was pretty special to you know have everyone disappointed um, not disappointed in me but disappointed for me the day before knowing what could have happened and then to be back the next day and seeing my mom and my grandma and you know all my cousins in the stands crying seeing me on the podium was pretty special to back that up um that's definitely a highlight obviously the olympic bronze nothing beats winning an olympic medal and you know it's the heaviest medal i own it is the most special one that i own and um that really is the culmination the reminder of all that hard work and dedication so yeah it'll be pretty hard to top that i think that's awesome so what's uh what's on the playlist? Your 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 iPod, your Spotify playlist, Apple Music, depending which one could be controversial, which one you do choose. But what what's on your playlist before you go out there and dive? Do you like to like pump up? You know, heavy metal, rock. Is it dance music? Is it- <laughs> mine is pretty vanilla. I would say I um yeah I just listen to music that is not too upbeat, but also not too slow. It's also dependent on my mood. If I feel like I need to get a little bit more energetic, then I'll listen to Beyonce or something that's going to pump me up a little bit more. But if I feel like I need to mellow out a little bit more, then I'll listen to something more slow. But I also just feel like I don't have time to find my own music and create my own playlist. So um, I just cheat and get other people's playlists and (laughs) find things that I like that way. So I have a pretty broad range of music that I like to listen to. Some days I'm listening to country. Some days I'm listening to rap. Most of the time I'm listening to just general pop music. So, um, yeah, I probably wouldn't call myself a music connoisseur, but I appreciate other people's energy and input into the music that I listen to. Okay, that's awesome. And whereabouts is your uh, – Did or do you have the Olympic tattoo on you as well? I do. It is on my wrist. On the wrist. Um, my mum always said to me as a kid that – I will never let you walk through the doors of my house with a tattoo unless it's the Olympic <laughs> rings because she knew how much that would mean to me. So I always pictured getting it off my on my left wrist. And after I competed at the London Olympic Games, I went on a holiday after with my mom and we were in Paris and she sat with me in this random tattoo parlour and watched me get my Olympic rings tattooed. So since then, I've got a cousin who lives on the Gold Coast. She's a tattoo artist and, and he's topped it up and done my 2016 and my 2012. So pretty special that's awesome has mum allowed you to get other tattoos yet or no well this is the thing i did well, get well, she doesn't tattoo. know <laughs> like i did get another tattoo with my sister on holidays last year and my mum was there so she was aware of it as well i think she's okay if, if they have meaning but i also don't picture myself to be someone who's going to be covered in tattoos yeah. and they're all in places that are you know are pretty easy to hide but all just meaningful little ones do you reckon mum will ever get a tattoo one day I, we tried to convince her, um, but yeah, she, she said maybe not just for now, but I reckon one day she'll come around. Okay. One day you'll, you'll definitely have to keep us updated on that story. Yeah. So last couple of questions, if you could only give one or two points of advice for all athletes out there playing sport, what would you say? Oh, I would say, um, 
figure out your why, figure out your values and stick to your authentic self. It's so easy to follow other people's paths or to get distracted by different people's journeys, but everyone has their own journey. Everyone's going to have their own story. So um, being okay with who you are and the path that you're on is really important, I think, and going to help you to get the best out of um, yourself, Uh, but also just having courage. Things are never easy as an athlete. You're always going to have um, hurdles that you're going to have to jump over and those points are the time where people fall off the bandwagon and give up because it becomes too hard but so many times when you get over the other edge of that hump and you've got a sweet ride after that until the next hurdle it's a really good feeling and that's how you build resi- resilience every time you get over one of those challenges you learn things you become stronger mentally um, and you realize that you can attack anything and get through anything so um yeah, have courage. Don't be afraid of the hard times because they're going to help you in the end. And those those two points go hand in hand with each other because if you know what your why is and know what you stand for, when the hard times do come around, you can reflect back and be like, oh, exactly. yeah, that's the reason why I'm doing this sport. You know, I'm, I'm doing it for myself, but also doing it for you know, mom and dad who drove me to the to the pool yeah. hundreds and hundreds of times. So mm-hmm. are, are, you got to remember that they sacrifice for you, and you'll continue to sacrifice and and trying to achieve something you haven't achieved. It's not going to be easy. It's going yeah. to be challenging. It's going to be hard. If it's easy, then you're probably not doing enough. You know, exactly. like it's, it's, it's going to be hard. So just remember your why's. And the point I liked the most was was being genuine. You know, like just just being your genuine self. Some of the best athletes that I've met and coaches are the exact same person when they're coaching and when they're off the field. You know, they're yeah. just very genuine. They want they're wanting to help and, and put the best performance possible. So if you can find out and understand who you are, then um, stick to that and, and just be the best that you can. Yes. So who should be my next guest on the podcast? Is there any sort of my uh, athletes or coaches that come to mind that you think should uh, come on for a chat? Oh, who should be next? I'm, um, I'm getting better with rugby being from Victoria. It's, it's, you know, you, you we've swayed more to AFL and yeah. I follow the um, Richmond footy club. So I reckon you should get dusty on. <laughs> Dusty, if you if you got a connection there, we'll try and uh, try and link that up. You know, oh, I could send a message, but I uh, I don't think Dusty loves the loves this sort of stuff. So I think it'd be a tough bet, but um, he'd be someone I want to listen to on a podcast. Okay, he is a pretty damn good footy footy player. So yeah, it'd be really interesting really interesting to understand his story a lot more and um, what it takes to you know play at AFL, a sport yeah. that I'm not very familiar with, even though. This is the first time I'm saying on the podcast, I am involved now with an AFL team here in Canberra, helping them yeah. out, uh, East Lake Footy Club. So I am sort of venturing out into that area as well. Nice. Yeah. Um, so where can listeners find you on social media if they want to reach out and just keep up to date with your story as well? Uh, yeah, so they can follow me on Instagram. It's just Annabelle Smith. My name is spelled a little bit differently. So it's just A-N-A-B-E-L-L-E, Smith. Um, and that's probably where I'm posting most of my stuff. Um, so you can check me out there. Easy done. So thanks for joining me today. This has been awesome to understand a different, you know, perspective in sport from a different sport that I really don't know. And a lot of listeners won't know. And it's, it's been great to understand your story, what it takes to be an elite diving athlete. You know, it's very similar to any other sport. You've got to have all these mental skills. You've got to have all the physical attributes, but it's just been really cool to understand your story and provide myself and everyone else with some really great take home points that we all can, can work on. And yeah, I just really appreciate you joining me today. Thank you. Thanks for having a chat. Thanks for tuning into another episode of Elite Rugby SNC podcast. Remember to like, subscribe and rate Elite Rugby SNC on Spotify and YouTube and make sure you follow us on Instagram. Sign up to come a beast via the link in the description or via Instagram page. So don't wait, make that good decision and join Elite Rugby SNC today and take your game to the next level. Thanks for listening.